Yes. Let's go. Go. Okay. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Steve, whenever you're ready. You rolling? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were rolling. Sure, so you, you forgot to say. Uh, I'm sorry. Speed. Speed. Okay. Carmen, what is this? But here on this table. Well, these are all the scraps and pieces of um, paper. A lot of it is torn up prints or dysfunctional watercolors or uh, whatever. And I rearrange them and put them together in uh, another form and I make collages out of them. Very tedious. It's, I wish I had an assistant to glue them down for me. But uh, uh, they're, they're kind of fun in a way. I guess if I were a businessman, I would have to say they're not cost effective because of tons of time in, on them and uh, the, the rewards are very slight. Let's, let's go about it from a different perspective. Hold that wide shot, Steve. I think it's extremely effective. Uh, the very wide shot, right? Is, is this. You're, you're not, you didn't just paint it. You have tried sculpture and a lot of different, you, you, mm -hmm. you can see, you know, these are a lot of different things you've tried. Isn't that true? Yes, mm -hmm. tried uh, sculpture, I, and not seriously, although I was thinking about this summer making some bronze sculpture. I have some ideas in mind. If I did do it, I would make them like my expressionist paintings, very, very peculiar, odd things uh, in, uh, in, uh, cast in bronze. Uh, the idea uh, tickles me, and I'm, I'm very well may do it. What about the one over your shoulders? That when you talk about abstract, uh, well, uh, this this was the this was the kind of painting I did after the after at my abstract expressionist painting, uh, a figurative exp expressionist painting. This is the kind of work that burned down. I had forty paintings like this that burned down, and these are the ones that I painted after the fire. Uh, I, I I probably have about ten of them or 12 of them. I this, When they're not right and I sit around for years and I don't like them, I just paint over them or tear them apart or something. I shouldn't do that, but I do. So that's part of what's on the table. <laughs> you know. thing to a scramble. Uh, <laughs> good. This okay. shows that we're ready. So thank you. Okay. Why don't, why don't you come off the painting again? Yeah. Just get her. That's a nice that's a nice touch. All right. Ready? Mm -hmm. So uh, so start again. This this is typical of what kind of painting then? Well this is the painting after abstract expressionism. It's now it's commonly called figurative expressionist painting. And when I did it, I, there was no one I know who was painting this sort of thing. Uh, similar things, I guess. Uh, these are the ones that went down, not these specific ones, but these are like the ones that went down in my fire. And 40 of them. And so it, that was very painful. Uh, and this is what I came back with after. When I first moved in here, this is what I started painting with. Or this is this way of painting I started with. <coughs> okay. Do we see enough of the painting? Did you, did you uh, I'll, I'll come back later. All right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now, I understand also to get directly. This is an easy segue. I understand also that you're a musician. Is that? Uh, That's true. That's, That's true. what I started as. I started not as a painter, but as a musician. Yeah. In elementary school, I played. This is funny when I think about it. I played the flight of the bumblebee for my graduation from elementary school. Yeah, and I studied with, I was a, a, a kind of a, what, uh, a bit of a virtuoso. I wouldn't say I was a genius or over, but I was good. And uh, after that, I, I after, uh, when I got into high school, I, I went to New York and I studied with some superb teachers. The first one was named Charles Thetford, and he played uh, in the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra. But he was one of the clarinetists. And then I studied with the Joe Allard, who was, uh, I played with Toscanini, and uh, he was top flight. He was excellent. Mm -hmm. And I became an accomplished uh, clarinetist. I was pretty good. And uh, then I took up the saxophone, 
Or I played the saxophone simultaneously with the clarinet. Mm -hmm. And I loved, of course, I love music, all, all the great musicians, uh, everybody, Bach, Mozart, Haydn, Brahms. I, I love all of them. Uh, and you're then I fell in love with jazz. You're still, you're still playing. I and still play. Yeah. I still play. I play with a very accomplished, uh, nationally known musician. Some of whom, some are actually world class musicians. Uh, th to establish my status very accurately and and uh, and without any ego or as little as possible, I, I I can play with top flight players. I am. That doesn't mean I'm in their class. I'm not. But I'm very comfortable playing with them, and they're very comfortable playing with me. And there are moments when I have my moments, as they say. There are times when <clears throat> I'm not bad. I, sometimes I'll play a ballad, and it's very. I, I can remember one playing with musicians who were better musicians than I was, and finished playing. You know, what did I play? I've forgotten the tune. I think it was Lush Life or something. And they said that was the highlight of the evening. And for me, since these musicians were truly better players, uh, this was remarkable. It was very, very uh, thrilling, actually. I think that happens because they play all the time. You know, there's an expression, they can swing at, they can swing at once. They just sit down because they're practiced. They're all, I practice all the time, too. But they practice with other players, and they're really, you know, top flight. Uh, and um, when I come in, I usually come in, I've, and I've been working on five or six tunes in a special way, and I'm like, maybe I'll play them a hundred times. I just keep going over and over and over until I really plumb the depths of the whole chord progression and the melody and the feel of it, so that when I come in on them, I'm coming in like a horse that's been in the stable, you know, when he gets out in the field, <laughs> he, has that fat, he wants to run, he wants to move. And so I bring this to it, and I bring uh, the intense feeling I developed for some of these tunes, and it works pretty well. Uh, uh, but again, I mean, then there are moments where I feel, no, I didn't do that very well. Do you have your sex by your feet here? Is that, are, we, are we like a talk show where the guy says, okay. I have well, to have him. Us, my, I happen to have your yeah, sex. Yeah, here's my act, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we do that? Well, I don't want to. Do you mean now? I don't want yeah. to play now. No, yeah, come on. No, no. Uh, I, first of all, in order to, I, I'll tell you why. There are yeah. practical reasons. Yeah. To get to, uh, to uh, before you can get a, a sound that's, even the slightest mm -hmm. decent, mm -hmm. you have to warm up uh, and you have to get your reed wet and reed. It would, this yeah. would take at least the 10 minutes really? for me. If I, had, if I had been practicing before you yeah. arrived, then I might have been able to do it, or maybe on another occasion. Yeah. And as I say, when I have my opening, uh, then I will have some really, if, if, if I'm doing what I did usually, and I can get my boys, the guys that I always play with, I say my boys, I'm the boy, really. Uh, uh, then it'll be, uh, then it'll be fine if we can get together and maybe take some. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I play well enough. I was written up in Downbeat magazine on occasion. I was one of the first freeform players. I, you know, I had articles in this paper and that paper, and you know, and the musicians I play with, uh, they. I drum, uh, Glenn plays with, uh, play with Stan Getz, and he plays with uh, uh, that wonderful English woman pianist. She's in her 80s. Uh, what the heck? Marian McPartland. He's done some records with her. And, and on occasion, I play with Mike Molillo, who was on a Grammy Award winning record. We're very good friends from way back. And uh, top flight bass players, all of them recording artists. Uh, and we have a good time. They accept me very easily. And as I said, I have my moments. <laughs> Though I'm not uh, at their level, nonetheless, when they start to play, to be, feel these waves of wonderful sound around you by these true artists. These are really true artists. This is just delicious. This is just wonderful. In some ways, I. I, I in some ways, I think that uh, music is the premier art. Uh, 
At least, let's put it this way, I'm thrilled more by music than just about anything. There are a few exceptions I can think of. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but music is the thing that... Uh, uh, there's another very peculiar thing about music. If I listen to classical music, the more I listen, the more it engages me, and the more intense it becomes, and the more beautiful. When I play jazz, a very peculiar thing happens to me. I get deeper and deeper and deeper in it, and I start to practice. You know, some, I practice on occasion up to six hours a, a day. <clears throat> and when you begin to get lose, lost in it, you begin to act like a jazz musician, which is sort of irresponsible and reckless. You know, you, you kind of feel, I don't want to do something. I won't do it. I don't feel like, I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, you play jazz and you begin to feel like a jazz musician. And frequently they're a little irresponsible in their ways and so forth and so on. But I thoroughly enjoy the company. They're some of my favorite people in the world are people that play music. Well, thinking about the end of the century, aren't they sort of a threatened species as well? I mean, <clears throat> in a way, they've never been anything but a threatened species. From my, well, all my life as a musician, jazz music, I, I mean, if I were a jazz musician, I would hate the idea of not being able to work enough and not getting the adulation and the accolades that, uh, that I might think of. But from my perspective, I don't really care. I, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I like jazz in saloons and nightclubs and so forth. Now it seems to be going into concert halls. I don't, I don't enjoy jazz in concert halls. But I'm glad that musicians have work. <laughs> it's good that they can play in concert halls. I like big bands in concert halls. I'd like to hear Count Basie in a concert hall, or, or Duke Ellington. These are, or, um, the, uh, it's a big band seems to be suited. They're, uh, they're that, I love that sound, that big, brassy yeah. sound that comes out of them. Woody Herman came to our school. <laughs> no, you can, Who did? Woody Herman, you know oh, it is? One of the herds. Big, big, oh. big sound. Big sound, big beautiful sound. Yeah. You want something you want to talk about music? Or? Very thrilling. Because I, I, I tried to talk him into playing. You know, maybe I'll, get, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you. Turn it over. Right? He's going to talk you into playing. <laughs> well, I actually, I actually would have done so, no, but I it just be quite. I mean, it's not that I'm shy or modest. No, I no, guess no. I'm musically, I'm a what, bit of. What, what, what I'm wondering is, what I'm wondering is, is that maybe it would just be like a grace note, not about actually playing a song for us, but even warming up in your studio by yourself is a little like, uh, you know, lonely artist mood piece, you know. Uh, it, 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 I mean, I, I wouldn't want to go on on this sounding bad, and that's what it would that's be. That's what it would be. That's what it would. Be. I'd sound yeah. bad because. I'll tell you a funny story. I, am I still on here? Yeah, come on. Oh, oh. <laughs> what? I mean, maybe I shouldn't put on this, on. this on, but you know, uh, Larry Rivers plays. And, uh, and, uh, and I've never heard Larry Rivers play. I don't know how he plays, but I imagine he's a pretty good player. And, uh, and Larry Rivers apparently has heard people speak about me. And uh, maybe, maybe he's heard people speak about me too much because <laughs> one day this friend of mine who's a, who's a jazz musician said, yeah, I saw Larry, Larry Rivers and I said, hey, Larry, you know Carmen Cicero? He said, I never heard of him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess, the, I guess that's the way he feels about, you know, he gets maybe sick of hearing about me. <laughs> What, what do you think about the direction popular music has taken? Just in I, I, I've never been involved in popular music in my life. I mean, sometimes after the fact, for example, when the Beatles came out, I paid no attention. But then through the years, there are certain Beatles tunes that I love. I think they wrote some, some beautiful tunes. And the same with all pop music. After a while, you, you don't realize that it's kind of come in on you. And then there are certain tunes that you hear that you haven't heard for years, and you say, Gee, that is a nice kind of tune. You know, I kind of scorned it when it was out, but it's really quite beautiful. It's quite, quite lovely, or something that really has a lot of uh, passion in it, or whatever. So, so, so you think in ten or fifteen years you could learn to like rap music? <laughs> I don't think I ever. I think of, of it as uh, kindergarten, kindergarten poetry with the saphead uh, music. <clears throat> Drumming. I, I don't. Th no, I'm not a jazz musician that I've ever met in my life. Could bear this. It's not. 
It's not about music. It's just about some rebellious people with a pathetic, uh, maybe kindergarten to junior high school poetry. I mean, it's, it's really pathetic. A little while ago, you were talking about uh, just uh, the decline in the backgrounds of certain youthful members of society today who will yeah. remain anonymous. <laughs> Is, is this whole thing, do you see this as a trend where music like rap music and dance that is no longer dance and any numbers of other things that we see, the total decline of the quality of life in America, do you see this going on? Or? It seems that way. Um, I, as I, I was, you know, I don't know if we talked about this on tape, I, I don't remember, but I talked to Ed about it, which is a very simple thing. Uh, media is all about how do you make the most money, and the most money you make is with the biggest audience. Who's the biggest audience? The last thing I heard was that half of America can't fill out a job application form. Okay, so that's a pretty big audience. And then there are other things that intelligent people don't get tired. They, you know, they work their butts off all day long, both the males and the females. I don't know why the female females want to do this. I mean, they've just joined the drudgery force, but hey, if that's what you want, go ahead. <clears throat> Most work is drudgery, and they've joined the drudge force. I, my life has just been trying to get out of work, and so <laughs> that's what I spent my life doing. But at any rate, when you've got two, two people working like hell, they come home, what are they going to do? I mean, have a beer, look at some mindless thing on TV, which, by the way, I do as well. I come home tired, I give me a beer, you want to see, you want to hear some fine, no, I don't want to hear anything fine, I want to hear something mindless and stupid. <laughs> and I turn on the TV set and I'm quickly satisfied, <laughs> but uh, that is not my, that's not the state of mind I'm in all the time. I think it's a luxury to be able to experience good books, good music, good poetry, that's, that's a, one of those luxuries that I think overworked people can't, can't have much of anymore. I, I just feel a gal that I knew once went to one of these mediums and clairvoyance, whatever, and the clairvoyance spoke about me. She said, oh, Carmen, he, leaves a he leads a charmed life. I said, she's 100% correct. I think that I do uh, because I have the luxury of being in my summer home. I'm painting, making a watercolor, which I love to do. That's one art. I and I'm listening to a book on tape, a classic, or I'm listening to classical music. How many people have this privilege? I don't think it's so much of the ineptitude of the populace, but the, the possibility is not there. I, I got a feeling that I, I couldn't get everybody to like jazz, but once in one of my classes, this was a, a junior high school class, I said, kids, I'm going to take time out, I'm going to teach you something about jazz, you're going to learn one tune. The tune was a Miles Davis tune, I still remember it, walking, wonderful swinging lyrical thing. And I just said, I'm going to give the story, and I went over, I pulled the shades down, give it a certain atmosphere, put your head on the desk, close your eyes, open your ears, don't think about anything but what you're hearing. And I just played this tune maybe about eight or nine times, and I explained it and talked about it, how you get the feel of the rhythm, the feel of the bass, the, what the sock symbol is doing, and what the ride symbol, all of the how people come in, how one push, and I went over and over and over and over. Half of the class went out and bought the record. My conclusion, that this doesn't happen enough for it to become contagious. I suppose if there were people who said, well, let's just try to put on, I'm not going to say uh, the last quartets of Beethoven or uh, those last sonatas by Haydn, I've just been listening to a piano sonata by Glenn Gould, <laughs> so beautiful. Uh, maybe not that, but some good classical music. If they were, curiously enough, in Cape Cod, there's a, a classical station. It's the most popular station on radio. So maybe some of the uh, some of the uh, producers, uh, maybe they're not so so accurate. Maybe they're not right. In other words, what you get used to is what you like. I mean, that's the big dimension to it. I think a lot of the, the, they're just getting used to what. If this is not to say, I, I go back to what I said earlier. I don't listen to popular music because I don't have enough time to listen to my wonderful classical books on tape, my wonderful tapes, jazz, uh, and so I don't even have enough time for that. 
to in, even to introduce new classical music is a little too too much for me. Or so and 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 pop music, there are people who listen to it every day, so it builds up. They got an ear for it, and, but I don't have that, and I'm not interested in it. I, I, you know, even the best of it doesn't touch uh, Mozart. So. Along the lines of the kind of stress you were talking about with two people working, you know, in the American Constitution says that we have an unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> you think we lost track of the pursuit of happiness somehow here? I mean, at least... Yes. I, I take uh, three and a half months off. In France, they have, what, a month? Everybody has a month. I think people should be... It should be a law. <laughs> Maybe I'm, you can't, you've got to take a week off. I'm sorry, you've got to take a month off. I don't want, you got to. Here, take a month off. <clears throat> maybe, uh, maybe life in America will become different. I think, uh, you know, look, if you don't have money, life is not very pleasant. I, I've not had money and it's been grinding and very <clears throat> eating away at me. But at the same time, if you don't have... Uh, you know, there's a fear of, of taking too much time off. There is a that strong fear. Because when you take time off, you have to be reflective. And when you're reflective, you think about your life. And when you think about your life and you realize what it is that you're doing, I'm working day to day, you know, I'm, hey, I got a great life. I became the uh, president of the five and ten or something. I don't know. And, and you forget uh, what it's about. But it scares people to, to be... Um, put them in a place where they're not, uh, the mass media isn't somehow filling their ears and their heads. This is, I think, terrifying for certain people. I can understand it. I don't say this with the disdain. I, I truly don't. I don't say this with a sense of snobbery. I don't say this with a sense of, some of my friends do. You know, they get very arrogant about, ah, oh, those damn fools out there. I, I don't feel that way. I, I, I see most people in this regard more as victims. Uh, you know, they're victims. They, they, they want material things. So do I. You know, I have friends who are Marxists, and I like to uh, tease them by saying, I strive every day with all my might to be an elitist, <laughs> which I do, uh, because uh, I think uh, that's the place to be. I mean, it's, that's what we want to be. Uh, or, or, or I'll say to him, uh, I say, I can tell you the one simple flaw of Marxism. Uh, it's, uh, if you went up to the, uh, uh, to the manager in the plant and you said, uh, if I work very hard or I don't work at all, do I get the same pay? And he says, yes. My next remark would be, where's the sofa? <laughs> That's the failing of, uh, of the situation. And with capitalism, it, it, has, it definitely has his failing. Big money is too much power. It's as simple as that. Nonetheless, everybody, it's a, it's a great human instinct to strive for money and comfort and material things and so forth. You, you try to thwart it, I, I think uh, the best thing you can do is control it at the top. I, I, I don't want to be, I think, that, you know, if my final word on, uh, on politics is I read a book on so, about social systems. The finding of the author of the book was None of these systems work. No social system works. I guess my feeling is uh, no such social system works in all countries at all times, in all periods, in all points of development. I think each situation called for it. That's why I'm essentially a pragmatist. I can't see how anyone could be anything else. How can you believe? I definitely don't believe in ideologies at all. I think that's silly. You've got a bigger spirit like what people call God or Buddha or Allah? I, or I, I believe, uh, that's a funny area, I, I believe uh, in the tenets of most of the great religions. I have a high regard for all the religions. I believe, who the heck, who was that author that wrote the Major Barbara and uh, I can't think of his name, uh, uh, George My Fair Lady. Uh, right. Hmm? George, George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw, right. If they asked him, what did you think of Christianity? He said, oh, it's great. I wish they'd try it. <laughs> well, that's the way I feel about all religions. They're great. I wish people would try them. But uh, people don't. I'm not sure I do. I'm not, uh, 
But even beyond the religion and the practicing of religion, which to me in a way is almost <laughs> like um, submitting to a witch doctor, you know, in some in forms. Is, do you think that there is a bigger force out there, unseen force that is? I don't or do know. you think we're just bumping along? I think we're bumping along. Uh, I talked to Motherwell about it once. He, he said, just in one sentence, he said, it's all biological. I think he's right. The closest thing that, uh, the sp closest spiritual thing to me, or the closest way to get the truth about m people and the truth about uh, mankind and the spiritual part of mankind and so forth is through art. And the reason is that a prose or literatures or doctrines do not work. They don't work because they take you away from truth, because you're trying to follow the words which cannot capture a reality. Whereas art does this in an indirect way, by metaphor, in poetry, uh, by metaphor in painting, by suggestion. It never, it never gives you the exact definition. What it does was, is it takes you by in poetry, by rhythm and by rhythm and lyricism and whatever, or I'm painting by beautiful color and composition and stillness. It takes you into a world and gives you a a, a, a truth. And well, it's or listening to Mozart. It's I, I like to say it's it's or Picasso. It's not the he used to say it's not the painting. It's the painter. What he meant is it's the it's coming in con you you through the painting. You come, as a metaphor or, 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 or uh, a manifestation of something that comes from the spirit of an artist. And if that is what you come in contact. This is the manifestation of that spirit, that vision, that view. And I think it comes through music. As I said, I've been listening to the sonatas. What you feel is the, is the, the, the delicate perception, the, how are you going to put in words? This absolutely perfect balance of, uh, of ideas and of um, musical form, whatever, I, I, it's impossible to describe. Uh, Mozart has it the best. I mean, you, you, you're, you want a certain kind of feeling and he gives it to you. See, I got enough of that, it's the shifts. Then the, the pulse is to, uh, it's the pulse shift. He seems to follow that human heart, that human soul, what it needs musically. And while he's so doing, what he's revealing to you is, I know that human heart. And that's, that, that's done through metaphor. I think if a preacher stood up and said, now the human spirit, all the words that he, say, that he says or preaches, you take to heart. You go home and you read them and so forth. And it's taking you further and further away because the words can't do it. Poetry can do it or get, help you do it. Uh, the road was a ribbon of moonlight. It's probably better than saying, you know, the road had the reflection of moonlight upon it. And, you know, the, the <laughs> giving you prose in the description. And, uh, you know, nah, maybe that's a terrible example, but I think you know what I mean. So I think that art is what uh, gives me contact to that which is spiritual. And it gets me closer to truth. And, uh, Again, I feel like that clairvoyant, I've had my tragedies in my life, like everyone else, but that clairvoyant was right. I lead a charmed life, and part of that charmed life is, thank God I can experience the great art of the world. Most people can't. I, I feel a certain sense of uh, uh, pathos. I, I, feel, uh, I feel it's terrible, in a way. And when I see people, I... Uh, I uh, try, uh, if I can't talk the way I'm talking to you right now, if I can't have that kind of human exchange, I just askew the person and go on to something else because it's not very, uh, it's not going to be very fulfilling. And at times in a, in a split second you can make contact. I was going a lot, I was going up to the Cape and I met this guy and I, I, I have, I kind of like Jewish people. I get along with them very well. There's something about their humor and their, uh, their interest in the arts and education and so forth that I like. <coughs> so this guy with a big Cadillac, he was a, you know, kind of a materialistic Jewish guy. I, mean, I, I liked him. <laughs> he had this big uh, kind of spirit and so forth. 
we instantly got into a philosophical conversation. That's the way I am. I start talking, blah, 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 blah. And we're talking about this, that, and the other thing, and materialism, and what's hard to get, and how life is, and so forth. And he said, he's getting in his car, and he says, well, anything you get for nothing, that's what it's worth, nothing. He jumps in his car, and he drives away. <laughs> <laughs> I started to crack up. I said, I think he's right. But what was so amusing about it was this all took place in the time it took to fill up his tank. <laughs> we went into this entire philosophical uh, discussion about life. Uh, very few people do. There's some people you start to talk to them and you know, it's, it's futile. But I know there are millions of people out there that would love that would probably get into uh, the arts and just be thrilled and love it and enjoy it. Do you think and there's anything we uh, William Carlos Williams was on television and he spent something about Jews and they got outraged. He was bewildered. He liked it and nothing was. As a matter of fact, William Carlos Williams lived across the street from a guy that was Jewish and they were good friends and he would say, boy, it's so nice to have a you know, a brother who's an artist and so forth, and it was totally misread. So that's why I say that yeah, could be a bit that somebody could hear this and all of a sudden I'm an anti have to go. We know that too. Right? Yeah. So like any comment that you make about any minority group, is, get it. Do you, do you need anything else? Then you don't need a slate again. I mean, a, no, a white. It's rolling. It's rolling. No, we want to hear all about all the minorities now. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> one, one, one thing is that, that, that do you think that there is anything after death? I, I have a lot of wishful thinking. <laughs> I, I, I wish I was like some of those people who I feel absolutely confident that when they die, they're going to go to a happy place. There's only one thing I ever saw in my life that I found to be uh, inexplicable. And that is I read a book once about doctors, and most of this dialogue was from doctors about patients who died and went through what was called the out of life, the uh, out of, what is it, the out of, huh? out of body experience. And they, they said that, um, and that these were doctors, and they gave their names, their names were in the book, so they, were, they you know, they weren't just, these weren't just uh, anecdotal things, they gave their names and they just described the situation, and some of them were astounding. The doctor said, we're operating on this woman, she's absolutely um, out of it, I mean, you know, the the line stopped, uh, buzzing up and down, and, uh, and she came out of it and she said, well, when I was there, uh, uh, her, now her, remind her, her eyes are closed, the nurse came in, she did that, she looked like this, she went here, my aunt uh, was coming up the stairs, and she came into the room, come, how did you, you can't see anybody coming up the stairs when you're lying on an operating table with her eyes closed, and, uh, and all through uh, all of this sort of thing, and it was but one story after the other, with this kind of I find that uh, strange. I also think that it is possible that you could recall experiences from the past. Uh, I'm not saying that I believe in this 100%, but the reason I believe it's possible uh, is based on this. We have genetic material. When we go from one person, there's magetic, uh, genetic material that comes from the past to us. That's a fact. And hold that and then think of this. It's always a mystery. How does a bird know when to build his nest? Uh, and he's, he doesn't even have an egg yet, but he's building a nest. Now, so, oh, well, that's instinct. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's no explanation. <laughs> what kind of an explanation is that? This bird is building a nest, doesn't know that it's going to have an egg soon, and yet does this. No one's given them that information. So that's instinct. What is instinct? I, 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 who knows? I don't know what instinct is. Something that I imagine would be transmitted through genes, you know, from one bird generation to another. And so why should it not be that some traces of memory do, are not possible for us to uh, contact or touch or whatever? That's a possibility. If people have gone into deep uh, psychological, not psychological, but uh, hypnotic trances, and boy, I've seen documentaries of them, they get absolutely crazy, you know, because they see things happening uh, that are so full of uh, meaning for them.
But, so I think that is possible. Those are the, uh, my, my ex-wife once had a, had a vision, I guess she was a visionary, where she saw, she had a vision about reality. She said, I could see everything at, I could see all of reality with the absence of time. Everything happening with the absence. Well, then I read a, a, an article about the, I think, seven theories of, of uh, this, uh, physics, about physics, seven theories about the world and how the world originated and this. Uh, they gave the exact description that my wife gave from her vision. You know, seeing everything all at once without, the, without time included. That's, uh, that's kind of strange when someone comes up with that. I don't know what this all means, but those are the only things that I find uh, inexplicable. I don't know if they're called spiritual. The medical thing, the out of body. There was a letter by Stanley when he's uh, looking for uh, Livingston, and he's attacked by a line. And in the letter, he describes the out of body experience. So apparently, this is something that keeps happening, and the people that. Of course, you know, when, you, when you're getting under stress, those endorphins kick in and your whole psyche changes. So maybe some of those things that you see when you're going off into the wild blue yonder, maybe that's a result of the chemical changes in your body, whatever. But that does not explain how a woman on an operating table with her eyes closed knows that her aunt or sister is coming up the stairs and what she dressed like and so forth. She said, I saw all of this. <clears throat> so if I understand you correctly, you, you're holding out some hope. <laughs> <laughs> some hope. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Who the hell I, I, don't, I don't have enough evidence. Yeah. I need more evidence than, uh, <clears throat> than some religious prophets. Well, in our lifetime, I'm saying in your lifetime and in my lifetime, there have been great technological changes that we've seen. I saw the invention of television, and really, we were at the tail end of the end of the age of the horse, which went on from prehistoric times. Yeah. We've seen jet travel come in. And do you think that, that the, all of this is the salvation of the human species? Or, or, or in the end, is this going to be its undoing? I heard something that was very, very, I was very disheartening <clears throat> on the air. Now, how did it go? Someone said that if a particular star did not hit the Earth at a particular time, the human species might not even exist. It said because this, this uh, star hit the Earth, was it a star or a meteorite? I'm not sure. But it was a person who was, knows this. It was a, meteor, a person who knows what he's talking about in this field. He said if this star or this meteor did not hit the Earth and, and change the development of, of the species as they progressed, we might not have human beings. There, it's just this, this, now, how, is he right, is he wrong? I, I don't know. But uh, I, I do believe it has a lot to do with biology. Now, the things that I said, they can be, pract in a practical way, they can be substantiated, you know. You threw some genetic code that's passed on, you might have contact with the past, or extrasensory perception that we are, don't really know about. That's possible. So, do you think wars will ever end? <laughs> Boy, <laughs> I'm not the, uh, how the hell do I know? Not in my lifetime. <laughs> I, I read a book called Bartlett's Famous Quotations, and what I find reading this book, if the human, human beings remain finite, their behavior remains finite. One of the first, first quotations in the book is, in Egypt during the time of the pharaohs, this one man says, well, the children today don't listen to their parents. I <laughs> What's this? This is something that the people say today. And it goes on and on and on with things that the same things are said over and over and over, generation after generation. So how, uh, how different is humanity? This seems to remain the same. Something peculiar happened with Freud. The human behavior became a little strange after Freud. People began to, uh, but then again, Shakespeare had the same kind of knowledge, didn't he, about the human psyche and the uh, uh, and how people are motivated. Uh, but Freud, after Freud, people began to 
to think a little bit differently. You know, that what they're thinking may have a be what they feel and think may be motivated by some kind of uh, unconscious pressures that, that are hidden from them. And so I did sense a little change there. But other than that, uh, that's pretty much finite. And who the hell am I to say about war? All I can say is I've got a feeling that certainly in the next three or four hundred years, I think human behavior will remain the same. Unless uh, technology produces something uh, that can be applied to the human being in some form or other, and then that might alter or give greater insight by simulating something within us. That is also possible. Who knows? All I know is the way it's set up right now is people go through some pretty terrible times in their lifetime and they suffer with illness and so forth and so on. I'm looking for that thing that makes you younger. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. So what do you think? Uh, I think that was a nice little extra philosophical piece. No. Okay. So we want to shoot a couple more pieces of the art. Yeah. <laughs> Images to just come by, and your voice will be another form, another part of today. Okay, that's fine. We'll try to make this easy. How about the uh, just the? Wow, uh, can you believe this? Wow, the Battle of the Sexes. Ask your question first. <laughs> yeah, I'm rolling now. Okay. Just put it right on top of that because there's wood to protect it. Yes, sir. A second, now I'm going to go back out and get the whole thing before you. In fact, come back out, Carmen, and walk across to get it this time. Okay. Yeah. This will be a real avant garde little uh, presentation thing. Yeah. Okay. All right, go ahead. The good thing about this is it shows some scale, you know, size. Yeah. This is very funny. 
about the difference in the movement. So all you do is you keep just moving. Do, just do our, you just do be working. Okay. You know, this just one, you'll have one that you can be sure and of. Just be sure this one. And that way. Oh, you're going to the union man, huh? <laughs> that way, the spontaneous creative guy is axed. <laughs> and the real guy is on. Because okay. it's fun. And all of, but, but I don't care if I see the whole thing. You, you just keep on the wall, right? Sure. Okay, yeah. go ahead. There we go. <clears throat> are, are we on the big? Are we on the mic up here? Are we on the? We yeah. should be on this mic. Then you should talk as you're doing it. You know. <clears throat> Boy, this artist is good. <laughs> <clears throat> Hmm? Cardboard? Okay. Here we are. This is good. You know what? When you keep doing this, as I have, you begin to get back problems. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. See if you can match the wood perfectly. Is that good? Is that matched? Oh, the sun's off a little bit. Okay. Oh, okay. That's all right. That's all right. <clears throat> I'm flying down to Rio. I like this one. <laughs> I got in trouble with the feminists with this. Yeah, you might want to check that in. Opposite piece of cardboard. She thought that uh, it was the meaning of the woman. Uh, and what I told her, I said, believe me, I painted it and that woman's really enjoying it. And I want to put it <laughs> And I should know. <laughs> okay, one? grab that. those there. Then why don't we do it the same way, Carmen? 
Just let's watch the let, shadows. From the let's let you walk in with it this way, so oh, yeah, that fits into the same blue. sequence. Because yeah. otherwise, we yeah. don't have a uh, we don't have a logical ending. And in fact, um, what you might want to do is begin in a little tight to pull out, just to give yourself a little cut. What was that? I'm helping him oh. think with me as a filmmaker. On cardboard. Can we take that? No, it's okay. The cardboard put this okay. on, you know, against something. Right. Okay. Besides, it's to cut out some of the color. including the other film. talked about this one, Capote. Yes, sir. Uh, he lost, his house burned down in Spain. And yeah, he lost the manuscript of the novel. I will. One second. <coughs> Only one. Only one. And it uh, near destroyed him, right? And he, and he, no, he said it was amazingly liberating. Oh. He was liberated by it. 